The internet has added a new facet to the art of 21st century war. Hybrid warfare involving cyber attacks, trolling and social media disinformation has proved an effective way of galvanizing support and even tipping the public mood. A group of Ukrainian hackers have been launching cyber assaults on Russian websites since the 2014 annexation of Crimea, but they're not the only ones using these methods to shape events on the ground. Russia's war against Ukraine. The attacks are not only taking place militarily, but also virtually. Ukrainian authorities accuse Russia of targeting government and banking websites, as well as deploying malware aimed at limiting the country's ability to defend itself, at feeding false information into social media, influencing public opinion and reducing Ukrainians' access to information. But Ukraine is retaliating here too. Shortly after Russia invaded, Ukraine's Minister for Digital Transformation endorsed a grassroots group calling itself the IT Army. An estimated 290,000 volunteers are using a dedicated channel on the messenger service Telegram to hit back at virtual Russian attacks. We formed um, an IT Army of Ukraine, so we invited like uh, people that who want to help to fight this Russian invasion uh, on different uh, fronts. And uh, there was they basically were focused on two things. Uh, first, fight disinformation and also take down um, the Russian infrastructure, digital infrastructure, because they were attacking us for eight years. So the war with Russia started not a couple, like a week ago. It started uh, almost eight years ago, and they were instantly attacking us. The IT Army includes members of the hacktivist collective Anonymous. The collective claims that over the past two weeks it has successfully leaked information from the Russian Ministry of Defense database and hacked into Russian state television and streaming services to show uncensored news of the attacks on Ukraine. Cyber attacks are often difficult to verify. However, some cybersecurity experts are voicing concern. Such attacks, they say, could be considered an act of war and lead to further escalation of the conflict. For more on the virtual scale of this war, I'm joined now by Joshua Tucker. He's the director of NYU's Jordan Center for Advanced Study of Russia and an expert on the relationship between social media and politics. Mr. Tucker, thank you so much for joining us on the day. This war is seemingly unfolding live on social media. How are different actors using it and how is that impacting events? Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Yeah, I think this is kind of uh, one of the things that's most interesting here is just how quickly information is able to be transmitted from what's happening on the ground globally. And that's had a couple of different effects. One effect is that it made the kind of original Russian disinformation campaign in the lead up to the election, which was based around uh, disinformation around ideas that R Ukrainians didn't like their president, that Ukrainians would welcome the Russians as liberators, that there were genocide against Russia, there was genocide against Russians in the eastern part of the country going on. It's kind of made those narratives sort of evaporate overnight, at least outside of Russia. The second thing that's happening here is that I think that social media has kind of been instrumental in amplifying the effect of the sanctions. Um, one of the most amazing things we've seen about these sanctions is that companies, whereas in the past companies might have tried to skirt sanctions to be able to sell their products, now set companies are even getting ahead of sanctions by pulling out of Russia. And I think that that's largely being driven by the realization among Western companies that they're living in a kind of very different era where social media allows sentiment around companies and how they're dealing with big public political events, like was the case in 2020 in the United States around the social justice movement, that that's become this kind of incredibly sort of powerful force as well. Let's talk about the situation in Russia itself. At this point, independent media is effectively banned and access to many social media platforms has been restricted by the government in Moscow. What kind of information do Russians have access to? What are they seeing of this war? 
I mean, the bottom line is that most Russians, if they get their news from television, are seeing the official state narrative. And the official state narrative runs along a number of dimensions, that this is the fault of the West, that this is a sort of natural reaction to an entire uh, period of NATO expansion going since the end of the Cold War that's been going on for 30 years. This overwhelming narrative, as I said before, that, you know, that, that Ukrainians didn't like their government, that they were ruled by Nazis, that this was actually an attempt at denazification. These are the narratives that people are getting on Russian television. But what's also happened, as you correctly note, since the start of the war, has been a crackdown on what used to be a more open system for Russians to get their news on the internet. Uh, we've seen the end of kind of, or even on radio, we've seen the crackdown on sort of the last few remaining independent media voices that were uh, accessible on the internet or on radio. And we've also seen moves to ban uh, outside social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, all of which is designed to make it harder and harder for Russians to get access to information that's circulating widely in the rest of the world about what's actually happening on the ground in Ukraine, including the sort of the setbacks that the Russian military is having fighting this war. But these restrictions must be noticeable to everyday citizens. How is the censorship being perceived in Russia? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I think on some level, we might look at this and see that if Russians suddenly realize that Facebook is taking, has been taken away, that Twitter has been taken away, that television channels they used to launch are taken away, it might be something that signals to them that the war is not going as well uh, as Putin might have hoped. However, it's important to realize that, you know, it, just as in, in Ukraine, this has led to a surge in patriotism, we generally tend to see when countries get involved in foreign conflict effects, what are known as uh, conflicts, what's known as rally around the flag effects. And so I think people, especially in the early days of conflict, are willing to sort of accept a lot what their government is telling them in terms of, you know, the necessity of sacrificing for the war effort, the importance of the effort for what's going on for Russia. However, some narratives are going to get increasingly hard to sustain. Uh, and that's where you get into the questions around uh, particularly the sanctions, right, which are going to have real effects, are already having very real effects on lives of ordinary Russians. And you also get into the question of the reality of, of the results from the battlefield, right? There are Russian soldiers who are not going to be coming home. And as those numbers increase and as the time goes by, that begins to conflict with sort of official narratives and it becomes harder for these things to be, to be separated. It's also the case that Russians are able to you know, Russians are able to access VPNs mm -hmm. to try to get information from outside of Russia, but that then leads to the, you know, the, the ramping up of repression to try to prevent people from doing this. Interesting stuff. Joshua Tucker, director of NYU's Jordan Center for Advanced Study of Russia, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Ukraine and Poland are calling it genocide. Western allies are calling it the indiscriminate use of weapons. A deadly attack on a maternity hospital in the besieged city of Mariupol has prompted demands for an international investigation into possible war crimes. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has spoken of atrocities of unimaginable proportions taking place since the invasion began. Amid reports that Russia is using cluster bombs and thermobaric weapons, the war on Ukraine appears to be entering a new level. And I want to bring in now Lauren Speranza. She's the director of the Transatlantic Defense and Security Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis. And she joins us now from Washington, D.C. Ms. Speranza, good to see you. Russia's attacks seem to be growing more and more indiscriminate. What's the strategy behind that if there is one. Well, thanks for having me. I do think the strategy behind this is uh, Russia is resorting to its traditional way of war. It's the playbook that we've seen in Georgia, in Chechnya, in Syria, which involves this kind of indiscriminate attacks that we're seeing, applying massive firepower, rockets, artillery, missiles against major population centers, essentially to try and rough up the city uh, enough that it allows Russian forces to move in and to facilitate their occupation. And I do think there is a, a blatant disregard for what they are what they are targeting with these strikes and these shellings uh, but part of this is also uh, their strategy to try and break the resistance of the Ukrainian people so I'm not surprised that we're started starting to see this horrible uh, humanitarian catastrophe take place 
Western nations worry that Russia might be planning a false flag operation to justify the use of non-conventional weapons. What's your take on that? I do think it's a real concern. I mean, we saw through the U.S.'s strategy of kind of aggressive declassification of some of Russia's false flag operations before the initial invasion, uh, that this is clearly in the Russian playbook to try and, and manipulate the information environment. Uh, but I think the Ukrainian people, uh, at least, and, and now increasingly Western citizens are very much aware of these types of tactics. Um, and I do think uh, that the Russians may attempt something like this to use to justify the use of a chemical weapon. Uh, I think the use of a, a tactical nuclear weapon is considerably lower than that. Uh, but you know, we've seen we've seen the use of these weapons in other contexts, and I do think there is great concern that that's a possibility here. Now, while all of this is going on, the two sides met for the first time on the ministerial level in Antalya in Turkey. I want to show you a clip of what Russia's foreign minister Lavrov said after the meeting. Let's listen in and then come back to you. Are we planning to invade other countries? No, we are not. We didn't attack Ukraine. As we've explained many times, a situation directly threatening the security of the Russian Federation was created in Ukraine. And Lawrence Baranza is still with us. The Russian foreign minister, they're saying we didn't attack Ukraine and we're not planning to invade other countries. The first statement is, of course, false. We know that. What do you make of the second? Ukraine's and Russia's neighbors, especially those without a NATO membership, have been holding their breath for months now. Right. Well, I think this underlines that the Kremlin cannot be taken at its word, of course. Uh, we can't believe anything we're hearing uh, coming out of the Kremlin. Um, and I do worry about the future of countries that don't have a NATO guarantee. I'm thinking about Georgia or at Moldova, for example. You know, The value of being part of the NATO alliance has been made crystal clear by all of these events. And I don't think that that uh, is a line that Putin wants to cross to invade a NATO ally. Um, but I do think, you know, uh, other countries that are not part of that umbrella and have those security guarantees are at risk. Uh, now, that said, I do think the Russian military forces are facing significant setbacks on the ground. This war is a lot more costly and time consuming than Putin hoped it would be. So I do think in the long run, uh, this is going to drain uh, the Kremlin's willingness or desire for kinetic operations elsewhere. So while we might not see a conventional invasion uh, in the short term, I do think they're going to continue to up the ante on political political warfare and kind of other types of hybrid threats. On Friday, Vladimir Putin is going to meet with Belarusian President Lukashenko. What's his role been in all of this? Well, Lukashenko is trying to walk a very delicate line. I think, uh, you know, he likes to pretend that his country has no role uh, in the in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but his decision to dance to Moscow's tune is one of his own uh, choosing. And you know, he is contradicting himself uh, in some of the statements claiming that, you know, Belarusian territory is not being used for certain strikes uh, or to uh, as a conduit for Russia's invasion. Uh, but, you know, he while he doesn't want to be dragged into a full scale war with Ukraine, because I don't think that's in uh, the populace's interest in Belarus, he also cannot be seen to be a traitor to Vladimir Putin because he he uh, dug his own grave. He's completely dependent on uh, Kremlin support. So both of those options would be disastrous for him if, if he can't balance these two. Now, this operation is not going according to plan for Putin. You said it before, he's facing tough resistance and he doesn't have the money or troops to occupy the country. What do you think could be an off-ramp for him here? Well, I think his invasion in the first place shows that he was never truly interested in diplomacy. So I don't think that there is any concession that the West can make to, to kind of end this neatly for Putin. Um, clearly, there is a lot of Ukrainian resistance. And I think uh, the longer that this goes on, as you said, the more difficult it's going to be for, for Putin and the Kremlin to sustain. The sanctions are starting to squeeze. It's more difficult for him. To, to be able to actually hold the territory. And even in the long run, I think uh, it, Putin will be hard pressed to be able to operate and build and sustain some of the critical infrastructure that's being destroyed in We're going to have to leave it uh, there. I'm the really war. sorry. We're running out of time. Lawrence Baranza, thank you so much for your insights.